talking about decommodifying labor in the gig economy or the platform economy. And I'll talk about uh, broadly what it is and what we have seen recently in some of the countries and what are we seeing in India uh, with regard to uh, the gig workers uh, in the context of the new labor codes that uh, people were talking about in the last session that I did there yesterday. Uh, so when I looked at the meaning of decommodifying labor, it gave me this uh, dignity which an individual or families can uphold a socially acceptable standard of living uh, independently of uh, market participation. But I think the explanation that Amit gave uh, was a better one. Uh, yeah. All right. So uh, there are two kinds of uh, work in the platform economy, as we all know. One is the crowd work, where uh, the tasks are posted on a platform, and people also register themselves on the platform. And then uh, you know the tasks are allocated, and they do it, and they're paid for it. And there are all these. Amazon Mechanical Turk is quite popular in India. Uh, the other thing is what we are more used to, that is uh, uh, the apps which are used and they mostly offer a local service like uh, our taxi services. Uh, so we have uh, an asset uh, which most of the time remains unutilized, so you can utilize it better by giving it away on rental. That's the philosophy. So we have Uber in India, we have Ola and then uh, there are a number of other Swiggy and so on and so forth. So, uh, what is the problem here? Uh, the main issue that comes up for the workers in the uh, platform economy is uh, their classification as an employee versus a self-employed or an independent contractor. So, an employee is basically one who has a clear employer-employee relationship, uh, which means the employer becomes responsible for more than just paying the wages to the employee and he has to pay various social security benefits, whatever is applicable in that particular country. So the companies are not very happy uh, to have the employee, the employee classification for uh, these platform workers. Uh, so they guard against trying any kind of uh, reclassification. They want to call them independent contractors or self-employed, and they don't want it to shift to being called an employee. Uh, but the platform workers have been challenging this and saying that uh, calling them partners and entrepreneurs is actually just focus self-employment. And recently, uh, the Uber drivers in the UK have gained a uh, massive victory. Uh, it is a struggle that they started around 2016, where some of the workers had filed uh, uh, in the local tribunal, they had filed a case uh, that they are employees. And finally, in 2021, that is this year, uh, the Supreme Court in the UK said that the Uber dri drivers have to be treated as workers rather than self-employed. So this whole issue of whether they are uh, wage employed or self-employed uh, makes a lot of difference to whether they are uh, being given social security and so on and so forth. So uh, basically, the thing is that these workers are not regulated by the government. Uh, they do not have, uh, so the minimum wages don't apply to them. So minimum wages uh, law, if it exists in any country, uh, they need not be paid that. And they also receive no social protection. And this is the reason why they, are, they wish to be classified as an employee so that these minimum benefits as a worker will become available to them. Uh, and the tasks that they are perform are more like a piece rated work, uh, which is very common in the informal economy in countries like India. Now, it is possible to do this because the technology does facilitate uh, setting up a piece rate uh, wage uh, by creating a kind of an average, uh, calculating the average completion of time for a task. A technology can facilitate the monitoring of working time uh, to ensure that the workers um, uh, work during particular hours, take breaks and so on. And this could help to comply with the prevailing minimum wages. Uh, but, you know, the employers are not, they are not employers, they call themselves, are not interested in this. If you look at the corporate sector in this um, uh, condition of working at home that has started, the corporate is doing just this. They are working at home, but they are the workers, uh, the employees are monitored. So it is a possible, it is a uh, possible thing which, uh, you know, the, uh, the app, the owners don't want to uh, do that. So uh, now the crowd work is uh, regulated by the platform and the platform decides uh, who can gain entry, what are the contracts, what are the prices. It can decide how and uh, in what context the participants uh, can meet each other. They actually can't meet each other if they are on the crowd work kind of platforms. Um, 
information, uh, what information is collected, how information is displayed, and so on. All the control remains with the with the platform, uh, and the government, as far as possible, does not want to intervene in this. Now, what was this judgment of the Supreme Court of the UK? They uh, said that these people are uh, are workers, are employees, and and some of the interesting things they said that the Uber fare. Um, uh, why? Because the Uber fare is dictated, uh, and the drivers, and that determines what the drivers can earn. It's not that they are fixing it. Uh, the contract terms, uh, Uber sets the contract terms. Um, you know, they uh, will be penalized if they uh, don't uh, accept rights. And uh, of course, there's this rating system. Uh, so the the court determined that all these indicates that they are uh, subordinated to the company called Uber, and in that uh, and it affects their earnings and the number of hours they work, and hence they that's how they this case was won by the Uber drivers. It has happened in many other countries. Uh, one a more uh, uh, recent one is in in Spain. It has happened in the United Kingdom, where uh, sorry in the U.S. as well. Uh, I've not gone into all of that, but the Spanish cabinet also recently approved um, recognizing uh, food delivery riders on digital platforms as being employees and not self-employed. Very similar to the UK thing, uh, except that that is again just like the Uber drivers, only restricted to these uh, food delivery uh, workers. Uh, now uh, to come to India, India has overall had a good uh, system. We follow the ILO. Uh, processes and hence, uh, you know, uh, social dialogue uh, that is the union activity is supposed to be, uh, you know, there has to be a dialogue before various policies and laws are framed, which has not happened in the case of the labor courts. And uh, since uh, 2004 on, they have been talking in terms of uh, rationalizing the existing laws, since they have, there are a lot of laws in India, labor laws in India. If you look at this, because we are a federal system, we have the center and the state and all that put together, it can come to more than 100 laws. So now with the uh, labor, uh, recently there was a reorganization in the name of labor reform, where the ministry codified uh, existing 44 central laws, that's the central one, not the state ones, into four labor codes. And these included uh, all formal and informal workers. And the four labor codes were with relation to wages, industrial relations, social security, and occupational safety and health. Uh, but the trade unions were not really in the discussion with the, uh, regarding this. And the trade unions feel that uh, many of the hard gained uh, uh, gains that they have got over struggle over so many years has been whittled down. Now, the thing about gig workers. Now, gig workers have actually been recognized in the labor codes. The only problem is that they have only been recognized in the social security code, that is this one. In the wages, industrial relations, and the occupation, safety, and health working conditions, they are not mentioned. So how have they been mentioned? Uh, they have been mentioned in various uh, acts. These numbers here are really the, uh, you know, the numbers of their, in the actual act, the social security code of uh, 2020, uh, the reference to gig workers. So they have actually defined the gig worker as a person who performs work or participates in a work arrangement and earns such activities outside of the traditional employer-employee relationship. That means they are not accepting them as an employee. And the social security has also been defined and in that definition they have included gig workers uh, and platform workers and basically here is social security. Most of what we would require in a social security has been defined as a social security thing as far as uh, the act is concerned, as the social security act is concerned. Then what are the other things that they have done? Because we have a federal system, they have allocated the role of the central government and the state government. And it's a little strange that they have decided that certain welfare uh, schemes for these workers, including the gig and platform workers, uh, will be uh, taken care of by the central government and the state government will frame a different set of uh, welfare schemes. So life and disability, health, old age, education and so on went to the central government. A provident fund, employment injury, housing, and all these other things, skill upgradation, and so on, went to the central government. So now people who have been uh, studying this and looking at it and, uh, have said that there doesn't seem to be any rationale for why this division has taken place. And it will become uh, more difficult to implement. It will become a kind of a clumsy implementation system by this kind of thing. Two other interesting, many other interesting things defined by the Social Security Code. One is to have a facilitation kind of uh, center. 
Now, this is interesting why I raise it is because uh, uh, many years ago in 2005 to 8 or so, we had a national commission for unorganized sector workers. I did two years with them uh, as an ILO consultant. And there we had, a, you know, created a social security bill. Uh, it was never accepted. And in that we had suggested that there should be facilitation centers. Why? Because most of these workers are uh, difficult to find, they're difficult to uh, organize, they're difficult, they have very low uh, sort of um, literacies. So they are not, they do not get this information that social security schemes are available or this kind of uh, thing exists. So this is an interesting thing, but of course it says that it's not an absolute necessity. If, if it is considered necessity, these things can be necessary. These uh, facilitation centers can be created, which will help to disseminate the information that such schemes exist and facilitate the workers to register themselves, to file and so on, and enroll themselves in the various social security schemes. It's not automatic. You have to enroll in each of the social security schemes. The other thing they have defined is the funding. And this is interesting in the sense that they have uh, clearly defined a contribution by the aggregators. So if it is Uber or Ola or whoever, they have to pay a certain rate and those rates are defined. So at least there is some kind of a contribution being made by the employer towards the social security scheme of the gig workers. And hopefully this facilitation center will allow for the registration of these workers so that they will be a one-to-one -one and they'll be able to get these. Uh... The other thing is, whether they have representation. And like I said earlier, the government generally stays away from regulating the gig workers, but here there is a small provision for government's regulation of this uh, gig economy. In the national, uh, in the representation for the workers, uh, the National Security Board will have, for the gig workers especially, five representation of aggregators, that is the Uber Ola type people, uh, as central government will nominate them and five representatives from the gig economy workers, uh, platform workers, as again the central government will. So at least there is some talk of a representation, which is, you know, uh, moving towards a uh, social dialogue or whatever for at least on the social security code, not on the others. And the government regulation, they have said that, you know, uh, authority to collect uh, the rate of interest for the aggregators, the self-assessment and so on. So certain, uh, certain activities, at least the government has said that they will try to uh, regulate. So that also is a little bit of a positive move. Now, can all this within the social security code be considered as decommodification? Frankly, I don't know. So uh, the, the frightening thing is that even though they're talking about vegan platform workers in the labor courts, they only speak about it in the social security. They do not talk about it in terms of wages or industrial relations or conditions of work and so on. So, and even where they do define in the social security, they, they are not entitled to the institutional securities. They are actually mainly uh, uh, entitled to social security schemes, which is coming under the state, uh, sorry, which is coming under the yeah, state. Provident Front, gratuity, paid sick leave, maternity benefit and so on is still, it's unclear whether they're getting it according to uh, this author, this uh, Sarkar. Uh, also, the, while they're getting social security uh, benefits, they're not necessarily getting labor rights in the sense that they cannot move a court and demand better or stable pay. And the government also cannot pull up the platform companies uh, for the way they're making the payment or for how long they're getting people to work and so on and so forth. Because the union demand is that there has to be clarity because you have these several aggregators and you have the workers who are intermittently working for different platforms for different aggregators, then how is this contribution which is being uh, collected from the platform uh, workers, from the platform um, companies, how is this going to be distributed? Uh, what, what number of days uh, and, uh, will uh, will, uh, and how will they calculate that number of days, which will define that they become eligible for these kind of services. So there's a lot of uh, uh, lack of clarity which the trade unions have been demanding. So, uh, in that context, we are saying, is this a, uh, you know, this is really a decommon. So, I'll end here that Ola is one of those uh, aggregators and they have done a survey to see everything is hunky-dory. And they also say that delinking the social protection of employment uh, lays the uh, from employment uh, and employer is uh, lays the foundation to social security in a progressive way. So, this is actually a view from coming from the employer. Uh, that is the platform aggregators 
and uh, on the other hand you have the gig workers trying to organize themselves and this is another one one of the very interesting uh, ways in which they have uh, been trying to organize themselves but uh, in the context of uh, europe there are many 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 more uh, aggregators uh, you know, so many many more uh, platforms of workers coming together and so on which can be uh, for some other round thank you thank you so much uh, dr runni and uh, let me apologize for not uh, uh, introducing uh, uh, her before uh, professor runni is uh, teaches economics at uh, amrut modi school of management uh, which is in ahmedabad university and she was the director of the institute of rural management uh, anand irma and rbi chair uh, professor of economics so thank you very much uh, i will uh, uh, we have exceeded a little bit of the time so yes. i will ask uh, ajay shankar ji now please uh, to come and speak he is a former bureaucrat uh, and he is a president of the board of trustees of foundation for msme cluster uh he's a member of the board of management of the jk uh, lakshmi path university where he is also the chairman of the center for policy studies over to you uh, uh, uh mr shankar about 10 minutes uh yeah thanks uh india today is at a very difficult juncture and the fact is that after decades of uh, economic development and a few decades of good growth the organized sector share in total employment is still around less than 10% so we are uh, unique in the world in not having been able to successfully take advantage of the abundant supply of uh, low wage labor to modernize industrialize and make our presence felt in the global economy so that is that is one i think factor which is important uh, the second is that even before the informal sector could become formal or workers in the informal sector could join the formal economy the nature of the global economy has changed dramatically so firms which last a lifetime and jobs which last a lifetime in large firms seems to be making way for the gig economy and these platform economies and that is entering india in a big way now today where we stand it is also a in problem that we are in the last few years we do not seem to be creating adequate number of jobs nor are we seeing increase in real wages or reduction in poverty and we are also seeing increasing inequality so when we talk of decommodifying labor i think it's useful to bear this context in mind i mean this uh, larger uh, picture in mind and also for the international audience it is useful to recognize that india is also a bit unique in having inherited a very well encrusted deeply stratified hierarchical caste system and that is still a social reality in big way in rural india and even otherwise so so the those who work have the inherited burden of being treated in a particular way in our traditional caste culture and 85% of those who work are in what are called backward castes or other backward castes and then you have the modern economy emerging where barely 10% are in the organized sector so so within this context i would like to draw your attention to a few i think uh, major concerns and also put forward some thoughts of where we need to move so the foremost requirement is to create more and better paying jobs and as the distinction between the organized sector and the unorganized sector of formal work or informal work is getting increasingly blurred i think it is time we thought afresh 
and try to create a new paradigm for ourselves. And the foremost building block for that paradigm should be the creation of fairly robust universal social security system in the country, a social welfare state. And to be funded by the state and the state in turn gets the revenues through taxes, taxes on individuals, taxes on firms. Because unless we take this big decision, the 90% of the workers who are in the informal economy will not get social safety in the foreseeable future. And they're too poor to really take part in a contributory system, which will give them anything decent. So, and, and the other distortion in the Indian economy has been that the most profitable firms are the most capital intensive and therefore employ the least labor. So whatever contributions they make for their workforce is very nominal compared to their turnover and profits. So what I'm submitting for consideration is that we move aggressively in providing full social security to our entire workforce and get the revenue by taxing corporates and individuals. And therefore the most capital intensive uh, profitable corporates will play a much larger share for this kind of social safety than you know firms which survive on the margin through a large workforce say, in a government unit. And the social safety code that has been brought in place conceptually seems to recognize this, but clearly as has been pointed out by the last speaker that these are very preliminary idea. So these need to be fleshed out fully. And as I'm saying to expect contributions for firms or from workers to create the corpus of money, which will fund a decent social security system in India is not likely to be available in the foreseeable future. So the state has to assume responsibility and fund it. And if you look at what the state charges by way of cess, we pay a higher education cess. Surely before that, we should be paying a social security says for all the workers or for health care. Uh, similarly, all corporates pay 2% for CSR. Now, I have nothing against CSR, but certainly the claim on whatever share of corporate profits we want should first go to social safety. So that, that's one proposition. The second proposition is that recognizing the need of the new economy the new four codes, the four new codes have also recognized a category of employment called a fixed term employment. Now the fixed term employment was again a concept which flew from a more traditional economy and a traditional firm. So I am a construction company, I have a project, I need some people for a fixed term. Or I have an export order as a government unit, I need some people for a few months. So the fixed term employment has been recognized and they're getting uh, they are supposed to get the same benefits uh, theoretically as regular workers. But the gig economy has created a different kind of worker. So clearly we need the law to come to terms with this reality and provide for the regulation of that kind of employment as well as the benefits that would flow to people who work in this fashion because they are a reality and they will remain a reality. And there are very good developments in the rest of the world in terms of recognizing them as workers. But since I'm suggesting that the welfare state or the welfare system should be funded by the state. So the contributions from these platforms of Uber or Ola or all the others, they should be taxed and the taxes should go to fund the state rollout for the social welfare requirement. Now, going beyond the social safety net or a social security system, we certainly need to look at how in the new gig economy, as well as the existing informal economy, workers can organize themselves better, get better wages, better working conditions, and so on and so forth, because all that is very fragile and feeble and underdeveloped in India, and we need to get that to move quickly. And here there are two, three good things that have happened and which shows that in 10, 15 years, a lot of good things can happen. So Narega has certainly provided a basic core of the right to work as well as social safety. and has been put to very good use in the COVID period. 
Similarly, the Food Security Act has been put to good use. So it's easy to build on what we've achieved and go very fast and very far. But the new idea that has uh, come around and which I think uh, should get formalized uh, in the political process and otherwise across parties and across states is that the worker not only has a right to work, but he has also a right to a decent income. In addition to the rights which a social welfare state provides. And then the right to organize and do collective bargaining within the reality of the informal sector in India and the gig economy that is emerging. So I think I would uh, leave it here and reiterate that we need to think afresh, think creatively and put in place something which will meet the twin objectives of creating jobs very rapidly, better paying jobs and therefore better wages as well as addressing the, the fundamental rights of workers in terms of the right to work, right to you know decent income and a right to uh, you know good working conditions through the process of collective bargaining as well as the regulation. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Shankar and uh, thank you for talking about aggressive policy reforms and a new paradigm which I'm sure we'll have more to discuss. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, I'll ask Himanshu to, to make his presentation. He teaches at the Center for Economic Studies and Planning in the School of Social Sciences at Jawaharlal Nehru University. Over to you, Himanshu. Thank you, uh, Amit, for starting the discussion. And I think uh, uh, Jimol and uh, Ajay Shankarji have both added to the discussion. But somewhere I felt uncomfortable with the whole uh, this is approach to uh, looking at the issue of uh, social security. I mean, obviously, the issue of decommodifying labor is not just restricted to uh, providing social security. That is something which is available to each and every citizen, citizen in a democracy as a worker, but also as without a worker. I mean, for example, the National Food Security Act or any of the other, for example, uh, social security provisions do not distinguish between you being a worker and not being a worker. They are supposed to be available to you irrespective of uh, whatever is your working status, activity status, but just because you are being a citizen. The reason I'm asking these questions, which is why I'm starting from the, uh, the, the from the reverse side is starting from the social protection issue is that somehow in the entire discussion, we are missing the whole nature of employment where there is a employer employee relationship. And there is an employer which is there. And the entire trade union movement in that sense, the big, from the beginning has been demanding accountability from the employer by the workers. There is an accountability, there is a responsibility that is that the workers, that the, the employer have, the people who capitalist people who are putting the capital and the laborers who are putting the labor have to have some kind of an accountability some kind of mechanism now that is something which is what we are foregoing if we are talking about a social security without putting the responsibility of the employer as to what exactly is the responsibility that they have i mean obviously the state will have various uh, responsibilities and that is part of a democratic structure NREGA is something that has been done for people who are not worker, but to basically provide them some kind of a right to livelihood in that sense. There are so many others which are there, uh, which have been brought in as part of the democratizing, deepening of the democratic processes. But this process of so universal social protection in that sense is in some senses also allowing the employers or the bigger corporates to the smaller corporates to go scot-free and pass on the burden of providing social security or decent work or decent wages to the workers, the benefit of which there is, is, is basically being cornered by them as profits. So you have a system of universal social protection where it is responsibility of the state, not the responsibility of the employer. And I think we should be asking questions as to what is the responsibility of the employer. Is it that the employer is something which is 
whose responsibility only is paying taxes and then getting out of the business because the rest of the part of the social security will be taken care by the state. It does not distinguish it to a small employer, to a bigger employer, to a person who is more exploitative, uh, to, to an employer who is more exploitative compared to an employer which is less exploitative. In a sense, provides a kind of a platform where you de-link the employee with the employer and you link the welfare, the welfare and the benefit of the employer to the state rather than with the kind of a work that they are doing. In a sense, that was the basic logic behind the gig workers. That the argument that was put forward by the gig uh, worker companies, aggregators, was that, look, what are we doing? We are simply a mediator. We have nothing to do. And that is where I think these uh, judgments which have come in other countries or, for example, the case that's going on in our country as well, of recognition that you have a direct responsibility over the people who are working or at least your profit is being generated by the people's contribution to the work that is being done is a question of accountability. It's not just a question of social protection. It is, I think, also a question of ensuring accountability, putting it black and white, that this, uh, these are the things for which you are accountable for. And I think that is something which we should also be asking for along with the universal social protection for, the, every, for every citizen of the country. Now, universal social protection will not distinguish between somebody who is a worker who is not a worker, somebody who is a service worker or a factory worker, somebody who is a formal worker or an informal worker, somebody who is a male worker, female worker. Or, I mean, all of these things are not there because that's the nature of democracy. And that is something which is a battle that has to be, that has to go on irrespective of whoever is, uh, whether it is a worker or a non-worker. I think that the second part is where I think we are somehow digressing from the debate and we are somewhere accepting this whole argument that the employers need to be, we need to find a way where the, there is an external agency which will take care of the workers' welfare rather than the employer uh, themselves. Now, this is simply the case as the, what we have symptom in, uh, something which is there in the, say, in climate change or the people who are polluting. I mean, where this principle is very clearly the polluter pays. Now so imagine the same kind of situation where the polluters are not paying, but they pass on, they are there free to do as much pollution as they want, but the government basically comes up with providing solutions to uh, mitigate those kind of pollutions. Now we can't, that system cannot work. Similarly, this is a system which cannot work. It cannot work for another reason, which is what I wanted to come back to is that essentially this is a fight not just for social security. It is a fight between capital and labor and over the last 30 to 40 years, what we have seen is that capital has not only become more aggressive, more confident, but has also managed to extract more and more benefits from the same democratic state, which is moving towards social protection, concessions which ideally should have gone to the workers. The lowering of corporate taxes in India, which happened in 2019 to almost negative, I mean, very, very low levels, where you have still have a situation where capital owners pay a tax of 15%, workers' labor income is taxed at a 30% on an, 20 to 30% on an average, and at a maximum rate of something like, say, 40%, 41%. So the difference between the way the state treats capital income and labor income is something which is evident there. You still do not have taxes on many of the capital gains, or even if you have capital gains taxes, you have indexation in various other things. So there is a distinction which is there. But what globalization has done is also where it has made capital become more and more boisterous. It has basically gone in search of safe heavens where it can create those situations, the kind of labor reforms that it wants. And most of the global economy, global companies have managed to do that. If you do come to my rules, then I will go to China, I will go to Vietnam, I will go to Philippines, I will go to South Africa, I will go to Bangladesh, wherever I can basically extract the same kind of a so they are not the ones who are basically suffering out of it because there is an open market which is there and the same thing is happening in the context, context of India where the states have lost the power to tax with the introduction of the goods and services tax which is basically centralized the entire taxing power with the power of the GST council and the states have no power to control the corporate sectors. And therefore the only comp competition that is happening between various 
states is who can offer better labor conditions and by better labor conditions is who can give maximum labor concessions to the workers in their particular state this happened during the period of the covid when state governments were fighting with each other to increase the number of working hours from 8 hours to 12 hours at a time when the entire economy was stuck the economy was closing down so i think the broader fight between capital and labor and how the state itself is becoming a party to the entire apparatus in this form of being a henchman of the capital rather than being a supporter or protector of the workers is something that needs to be understood not only in national context but also in the global context and in some ways a large part of the progressive movement or large part of the progressive uh, academia and policy apparatus has also accepted those norms and has actually started speaking in a language which is basically saying that we have nfsa we have nrega we have right to education we have everything and in some senses giving them the freedom giving the given the given the kind of a free pass to the employers by saying that look we have a universal social system social protection system and therefore your responsibility is not there i think this is not the intention of any one of us this is not the intention of anybody who is talking about it and those rights and those fights have to go on irrespective of whether the person is a worker or a non worker or a child or a informal worker formal worker service worker factory worker all of these are completely irrespective and that is how all of these laws basically operate and that is how they should be a universal social protection system but that battle cannot be at the cost of it but rather that battle is a battle which is in support or basically a complementary battle to the larger battle where you made the people who are with capital who are enjoying the benefits of labor of cheap labor what i would call or exploitative labor i would call also pay up and be responsible be accountable rather than simply passing on the buck to them i think that is a battle on which we are losing and unfortunately what amit was talking about the process of contractualization or informalization which initially began with lower level drivers and cleaners and various other kind of workers has now reached a situation where a majority of the teachers in delhi university one of the biggest universities are now contractual workers informal workers without any social security without any security of tenure without any leaves without any other facilities because they are all what we call as ad hoc workers and that number is now almost 50% of the total teaching capacity it has also percolated down to the basic essential services for example a large part of our social i mean public health institution the asha workers accredited social health uh, activists they are now what we call as honorarium based workers which is that they don't get any fixed salary they don't get any uh, social security benefit and majority of them are women we are talking about education system where again a huge number of teachers the basic uh, part of the teachers are now what we call as a very honorific term that we use a shiksha mitra which is a, a kind of para teacher but we call him as a teacher friend but again that is a process that has basically led to contraction so then again where a weakening of the entire structure where the state state's responsibility of providing basic health basic education basic immunization basic nutrition is a system where the worker uh, 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 the employee employee relationship is completely broken down the public sector workers who are the most protected are now among the least protected and they are being basically told to uh, enjoy those social protections not as part of their contribution to work but simply because they are part of a social structure where social protection is available now how do we reconcile these things how do we make sure that we have a system where the your 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 uh, your, your participation in the work your participation in the labor market is also something which is which is ensuring you certain basic rights that social basic right that right is what is where the whole decommodifying labor has to insist on not by delinking with labor but by making labor the precondition on which we basically start negotiating rather than passing on the burden the burden to the state and leaving the employer completely outside of the domain of the entire discussion that we are having about remember we are talking about civil uh, labor we are not talking about uh, and the labor process has to start with linking the employer with the employee fixing accountability to the employer fixing conditions of work fixing wages fixing decent uh, living conditions 
and all of these things that has to come from how capital and labor interact with each other by not delinking but by ensuring that the linkages are uh, clearly enunciated in whatever form we are doing it. Let me stop here and then I'll take a few questions. Thank you very much, Himanshu. I think uh, you've <clears throat> brought in very important aspects of the employer-employee relationship and um, I think we'll have more discussion on that. And uh, thank you to all the speakers for bringing in their perspectives. We have had a broad range of uh, ideas or, or, or how should I say, uh, from the integrities of getting rights for, uh, for uh, uh, say, cab workers or uh, small or large, in this case, uh, companies uh, getting uh, the UK case and the Spain case. So that is very hopeful, uh, which is at the very micro level to the larger question of what is the role of state in terms of uh, is it just a social security provider uh, and, and the third party, as Himanshu was saying, uh, or we need to rethink the paradigm. And when you are rethinking the paradigm, uh, what is the role of the state and what is the role of the employee, uh, which is a, uh, a moral just obligation of an employer and how do uh, how do countries and constitutions think about this morality uh, and uh, bring that to bear upon uh, uh, the private corporate sector. So uh, I think we have a, a very interesting broad range of issues being talked about. And uh, I, I will first invite uh, questions. We have one question already in the Q&A. I will request the attendees to please uh, type in uh, their uh, questions in the Q&A or the chat, which we can then transfer to the Q&A. But if you type it into the Q&A, that will be uh, great. Uh, so let me uh, take the first one uh, or the last one. Uh, uh, this is from Selena. Selena, uh, this question is uh, put by her to uh, Ajay Shankarji, and she wants to know uh, uh, I would be interested to hear more about how the creation of better jobs should be addressed, uh, uh, especially in the context of a slowdown economy, probably, and job loss, which we are seeing. And I will also have others, uh, Himanshu and uh, Professor Unni, uh, share their views on this. Mr. Shankar, please go ahead. Uh, this is the most critical question confronting India today. And uh, I think uh, the, the problem or the, the conundrum is that jobs have to be created by private investment in the marketplace by those who own capital. That is the only game in town across the world. Because the state can create some jobs, but certainly it cannot create the jobs that society needs. So we have to figure out what is it that we have not been doing right in our policy framework, in our incentives and so on and so forth, as a result of which we are not creating jobs in the numbers that we need. If we just do a comparison with China, it's become very fashionable nowadays. So 91, we were at par in per capita income. We were at par in technology. Today, they are five times ahead of us in per capita income and GDP. And they have got rid of poverty about 10, 12 years back, more or less, by successfully creating jobs, labor intensive jobs for the global economy. And every successful industrializing country the last 150 years has done that. We have somehow become sui generis 70 years of development in creating jobs in very high tech areas and not creating jobs in very basic areas. So, so, so we are not even I mean, we struggled in the WTO to get some rights for government exports. But when the WTO regime of quotas went, we were unable to create a share for ourselves in the global market. So that's the question we have to ask ourselves is why are we not creating enough jobs? What is wrong with our policy framework? What is wrong with our incentives, the regulations and the laws? And how do we get it right? And, and this is subject for a full discussion. So in a couple of minutes, very difficult for me to say more than that, more than that we need to think afresh and try and get things right. I mean, I would just give one extreme example is the kind of thoughts I have. Uh, 
I'd much rather, you know, create a set of garment factories in Bihar and Bengal with stitching machines for the global market and offer it to investors from Delhi and Bangalore. Please come here, use it for six months, free of cost. If you succeed, start making money, buy everything and keep the workers and use them. And I will pay social security for the workers also. I will train workers at state cost. But for heaven's sake, create jobs in Bengal and Bihar. Bangladesh has done so much better than us. That should cause a lot of national introspection. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I have, uh, if please, Himanshu or Professor Unni, you want to also add to that? Especially how uh, how is China, in, being a, a state-driven uh, country, is able to do what we are unable to do in terms of job creation, which are, say, labor-intensive? I think, uh, look, uh, as as you like I pointed out, this is the uh, important question that we have been dealing with. But I think, again, I would say that uh, when you're talking about creation of better jobs. Sorry, Manchu, the creation uh, of better voice jobs. cracking a bit. Can you uh, speak a little louder? Your voice is cracking. I don't know. Is, it, is it better now? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 please go ahead. So I was just saying that uh, the question of uh, not just the creation of jobs, but the question of uh, better jobs. And in that sense, uh, we all know, I mean, we all are uh, at least are, uh, in agreement with that, that we don't create jobs in isolation. Jobs come with creation of economic activity. And when you, and that is where I think Vajayaji's example of creating a textile uh, factory in Bihar and Bengal and bringing capital and labor, all of that is uh, there. I think we need to have a proper ecosystem where the industries can be created. And that is something where it cannot be, jobs are only one part of the outcome that happens with that. Uh, credit is important, various other things are important, but I think above all there is what we also call it as a, a huge buy. Even unless we are willing to buy everything from that investor who is willing to put in capital, just by giving him free machines, free labor, free everything will not work. I mean, he need to sell it somewhere. And that selling it somewhere would require demand to be generated either domestically or uh, has to be generated outside. Fortunately, China was in a fortunate phase of world economy where world demand was going up. The process of globalization was in a situation where the companies are moving towards cheaper sources of labor and China was becoming the factory over a period of time, supplying even to the global big industries. I mean, today we have a situation where the most of the, even America is now talking about building America. I mean, the whole Biden plan is basically where they want to build infrastructure in America. And then we are shifting towards a system of protectionism rather than a system towards globalization. At this point of time, I think the question for India would not be to uh, whether it can export, but do we have mechanisms of creating enough demand in the, the economy? And I think once you have enough demand, then the question is not of how the labor will be created. Then I think the question will be how to make the jobs a better quality jobs because there will be demands, there will be jobs that will be created automatically. But if your own domestic demand is faltering, it is going down, your own people are not, then I think, I don't think uh, uh, there is anything that, you, that can be done. And I think I want to clear the myth once and for all that for people talking about that India's labor laws are a problem or India's labor is not cheap, that's the biggest myth. I mean, you can actually go and set up a company or factory in any part of this country, in any state, and you can freely enjoy all sorts of labor laws that you want. Because the implementation is what is important, and you know how laws are implemented in this country, whatever may be there on the paper. And I think that's what I think is where this myth that uh, India is an uh, anti-labor country, whereas the other countries are flowing, that's not something which is there. Really, the question is that, is there an ecosystem which is there? Do we have 24 hour power? Do we have infrastructure? Do we have a skilled uh, managerial setup? Do we have access to credit? And do we have access to market? All of these are not there, then you can't create jobs. So it's a holistic whole package that we're talking about. And this whole question that you create jobs, that doesn't work unless you create an ecosystem which allows the economy to grow through a process of creation of demand in the domestic economy itself. I just wanted to add to that debate. That's it. Okay, uh, Doctor Unni, you want to add to some add to that? 
Yeah, so uh, I totally agree with uh, Himanshu that, you know, uh, India basically has some of the best laws. Of course, with this labor code, a lot of things have changed and a lot of things have been uh, sort of pushed out of the window uh, without people knowing it, without recognizing it and so on, or without being able to fight for it. That has happened, yes. But otherwise, we do have a lot of good laws and we have, like I said, right in the beginning of my presentation, you know, uh, signed a lot of the, ratified a lot of the ILO conventions, which even the United States of America has not. I mean, the United States of America has ratified the least number of conventions. But then the question is of implementation. Implementation of those laws is where, uh, you know, the leeway is given to the employer. And increasingly so after the uh, economic reforms of 1991, where the demands from the the demand from the employer, uh, large corporations and so on for labor market flexibility uh, has been very strong and the government has been uh, sort of giving in to that. So to that extent, a lot of the, uh, it, you know, what was protection to workers have, you know, slowly uh, sort of, for example, even the question of, of inspectors, uh, inspection of uh, premises. Uh, that is almost uh, the you know they don't hire any more labor inspectors so there's uh, and it's all like a self certification for the uh, enterprises to say whether the they are following the laws or not so these are all ways in which uh, the existing laws are have been um, sort of almost nullified and so on so that's one part of the story the other part of the story is that at least 45 percent of our workforce are not employees they are self-employed so uh, that we can't, uh, you know, we can't just shove it under the table. Everybody is not having, are not in an employer-employee relationship. We need a lot odd man out, odd man, odd woman out, whatever. Uh, to say that, you know, this is a very large component. We've just done a book on women entrepreneurship uh, in India. And uh, this, we all, I mean, we try, our we argument here is that these small enterprises, women, uh, not women, tiny enterprises, uh, should be treated as though they are an entrepreneurial class and then all that ecosystem which Manchu was just talking about uh, should be uh, made available and uh, provided to them because otherwise when we say entrepreneur and when we say enterprise and when we say um, self-employed we are really talking only about the top segment of that uh, of that group and that top segment uh, is able to access all the all these resources starting with credit and starting with every other kind of resource which is available, the schemes which are available, the tax exemptions which are available, they are able to, um, you know, be able to uh, have the information and access it. And we have this huge component of what we call own account uh, enterprises, which are the family uh, run kind of enterprises. And it's huge. If you look at the economic census, it's like, you know, of the non-agricultural workers, it's more, more than 70%. Uh, so that component, they are not employees. But they are that, uh, you know, they become the working poor, they become, you know, uh, not able to manage this because there aren't enough jobs and also because there are certain traditional skills that people have and they want to be there. They might want to be there, they might not want to be there, so exit, entry, etc, etc, formal, informal, all those, none of those debates are settled. But that is a huge component. So if we want to create jobs, uh, of course, we can't expect that all the jobs will be created for this 1.3 something billion people in this country from uh, the large enterprises. It's not going to happen, not in the near future. So if that is, uh, that is not going to happen, then what are we doing for this huge segment of small enterprises uh, to keep them, uh, you know, at least with that minimum standard of living which that uh, commodifying labor had a, had a definition of some kind. So that 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 is, I think, uh, an issue that we can't get away uh, get away from. And as far as trade unions are concerned, you know, are they talking for these people? So these people might be having their own associations of some kind, or they might be having, uh, you know, associations or cooperatives or whatever they have. Uh, a lot, most of them don't have don't have that. So who speaks for them? They are not at the table when the planning commission, or we don't even have a planning commission anymore. When there is talks before the budget. Uh, with the uh, finance minister, they are not at the table, and they are the ones that might be providing and or uh, getting uh, creating their own jobs. So that's that big segment which also we have to worry. Uh, you know, uh, we should be worrying about if we want uh, job creation in uh, this country. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, 
uh, I would, there is another question uh, which is addressed directly to Professor Unni, but again, I would want the other uh, panelists to also reflect on that, uh, which is uh, Stephanie asks, uh, would it be possible for uh, you to uh, come back to your definition of decommodifying labor? Uh, so that is not my definition. Actually, I was quite confused with this decommodifying labor. And I totally agree with Himanshu that it's not social security alone. I totally agree with that. But, you know, so I looked up a definition of decommodifying labor and I came across this strange definition. Degree to which the individual or families can uphold a socially acceptable standard of living. There I agree. Independently of market participation. That part I don't understand. I mean, if, whether you're an employer, employee, then also you're market participating. I'm an economist. And uh, uh, if you are a self-employed, then also you are participating in the market. So I don't fully understand that uh, definition of uh, decommodifying uh, labor. But I think uh, Amit gave a better explanation of that when he started the... Uh, well, uh, I would have uh, first Mr. Shankar and Himanshu have their opinion about uh, irrespective of market. And there is where the state's ability to impress upon employers or pass laws or bring in a system as uh, was talked about a new paradigm i mean this balance between state and corporate uh, how do we where do we draw the line and to what extent do we push it through uh, and what himanshu was saying that is it through taxes only that we we as a third party the state uh, provides uh, social security and other kind of support systems to the workers or employees or through legislation and constitutional provisions you bring in laws and implement laws either at the central level or state level which is a bit confusing these days uh, you relegate those uh, responsibilities to state governments and then uh, there is a problem how much of that can uh, uh, can be done by the state so this balance is a tricky thing and there's political economy of course uh, so can i have mr shankar and himanshu uh, also uh, take this up uh, you see, the 90% of the workers are outside the organized sector. And they don't get enough attention in the discussion space. And that's the world where real incomes have not been rising adequately and last few years may have fallen. So that is what we need to focus upon more than we normally do. Now, for the 10% in the organized sector, as was pointed out, our labor laws are pretty modern and, and drafting. And there is this relationship of employee contribution and employer contribution and so on. So, so it's a pretty recent architecture in place. And the new codes haven't really done away with that. Now, the point which is of this decommodifying labor has two dimensions. One is the informal sector employees, the self-employed, who have great difficulty in terms of having a decent life or a decent income, and the new kind of worker emerging in the gig economy. So India is getting, first one was large enough, and the second one is growing rapidly. So when I'm, we talk of decommodifying labor, my understanding would be, and I repeat, a social safety system or a social welfare state funded by the state and when the state funds it, it will do it by taxes and taxes on corporates is what I had said earlier. So it's not that the corporates wash away their hands from this responsibility. And there's certainly a very strong case for raising corporate taxes in India. On that, I agree with you much. Now, the second is the right to a basic level of income. So if as an informal worker or in the gig economy, my income levels are below a threshold, the balance must come to me from the state, which in turn gets it from the firms who generate wealth and incomes. The next component is the working conditions. And those working conditions have to be decent. And they need to be decent by first strengthening collective bargaining. And that also becomes much better if enough jobs are created and wages rise. Because working conditions improve in the market only when wages rise. And if the wages do not rise for that kind of work, then the law may say something. The law may provide for a minimum wage, but it is never implemented. 
So the biggest corporates are the best employers because for the kind of workers they need or the employees they need or the management they need, uh, the, the bargaining power of the employee is large enough, they get very high wages and they are well looked after. So the problem is how to get enough jobs created, create enough demand for labor so that wages go. That strengthens uh, bargaining rights. But I think in the framework that we need to evolve, we need to provide enough state regulation for the rights for a decent uh, working condition, combined with a system of collective bargaining for those who are outside the organized sector. So the new gig economy and so on and so forth, these are difficult issues, there are no easy answers, but this needs greater discussion and debate because then we finally succeed in decommodifying labor and give the worker all that is in first in our own constitution in the directive principles. Imanshu, you want to? I think uh, Ajay ji has made it very clear and Jimal also has made it very clear. So not much to add, but I think the point that I was making was, uh, and which is related to the fact here that how do we look at labor? That definition is something which needs very important to, and it's not just the labor which is in an employee-employer relationship, which is what I think uh, Jimon also made it very clear, particularly for women, but also for a large majority of the informal workers. So, because I think a large majority of the women workers, when they are uh, when we are talking about, or informal workers, when we are talking about, there may not be an employer-employee relationship, but they are in a production relation. I mean, whether they are farmers or they are, and that they they go, they get affected by the broader policy structure in the sense. What is happening to political economy? I mean, what is happening to prices? What is happening to markets? What is happening to uh, various policy interventions in that sense? And, the, and that is precisely what I wanted to bring in the issue. That uh, today, if you go and tell the farmer that look, we have NFSA, you have NREGA, you have all of these things, but your economic condition is worsening. He is a worker. Let's recognize him. A small farmer is also a worker. A woman who is tending to goats or uh, poultry or various other things is also a worker. But there, when I'm talking about uh, labor uh, rights or the whole issue of how do we treat those as part of labor, not as some, uh, not just as an incidental, but as part of a major part of the livelihood structure, then I think we need to define those things very clearly. She has a maternity entitlement, right? Just as a public sector worker has. But who is going to provide that? She has a right for leave. She has a right for uh, uh, various other facilities that anybody would have. I mean, how is how how are we going to make how, how are we going to ensure that these things are also taken care of? I think a large part of decommodifying labor in that sense is to not just talk about social protection as the only component of it. I think the working conditions, getting a decent income from the work that you are doing is as much a part of that agenda as much as it is for some kind of a protection that is there, some kind of a protection from exploitation, protection from risks, protection protection from uh, uh, any accident that happens or anything that is that you incur, is all part of the structure. And I think that part can begin from first defining who is a laborer. How do we define a person as a laborer? And the moment we take a more expansive and a more broader definition, which is what Jim Jimol's uh, uh, work for the last 30, 40 years has brought in the focus, the whole informal workers, but also uh, women workers in that sense. That is when I think we can start talking about social protection, not as a piece by piece apparatus, but as a whole, whole part of the structure, which not includes only the uh, what is comes as a part of citizenship, but also comes as part of your being employed in a livelihood employed earning a livelihood from that. I think that is the beginning point of it. I don't think there is there is a perfect definition that we can have of decommodifying labor, but at least a beginning will be to recognize all labor as labor and in what ways that labor interacts with the market, with the state, with the employers, is the bigger corporates. There is a chain that is there. I mean, we can't, I mean, even a small farmer engages with a large chain where at the end of the will be a corporate or a bigger guy in that sense. We need to look at all of these to be start talking about defining what the commodification of labor is, 
For that, let's first define what all is labor. That's what I'll say. Okay, thank you, Imanshu. Uh, we've lost your video feed, so uh, just wanted to tell you that. I think that's a that's a very important question, which has also been uh, uh, referred to in earlier sessions. Is uh, the 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 work, uh, the domestic work, uh, which is done by women uh, at home, uh, and and also which uh, ties into the self-employed work, which individuals do or small groups of families do. How do we define their work? How do we ensure that? Uh, how do they come into the larger ecosystem of uh, labor rights and social security apart from the social security that is provided by the state in terms of Narega and food uh, and and uh, all the other programs. So that is an important point. And if any one of you want to take that, uh, uh, please go ahead. We have about uh, slightly less than 20 minutes. So uh, we have some time. The other thing I wanted to, uh, which came to my mind, which uh, I think is an excuse used by industry, and when you talk to industry people, is the uh, uh, the ability of workers, the skill ability of workers, and uh, it is often uh, one of the reasons that is often given is that uh, the skilled worker actually is not as useful for them, and they rather have unskilled workers, which they then train, and and they then use that as an excuse for 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 all 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 these kinds of provisions which they need, which is to hire and fire them. And they will be the judge of what needs to be done. So I would also like uh, to hear from you uh, the role of education and skilling. How do you what do you think what is happening there and uh, especially in the formal sector, not so much in the self-employed and informal sector, but uh, with all this skill cooperation of India and so much money being pumped into it, uh, India being uh, on the cusp of a demographic divide having uh, the largest uh, uh, working population and in all that context uh, th that 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 is what uh, we wanted to uh, reap the benefits of so i would also like uh, so i would like your comments on the skilling and education part and also if you want to take uh, uh, ahead what himanshu talked about defining uh, uh, labor and uh, uh, care economy etc and women's work which is not recognized uh, please go ahead any one of you okay let me let me come in uh, see on on this uh, skill issue uh, there are few dimensions which again make india a bit unique so so the most important one and which is uh, lost not normally referred to is what mahatma gandhi saw when he came back to india and he saw it as intrinsic to indian society and to our caste hierarchy and which is that using your hands for labor was beneath your dignity and you were inferior if you did that. So he insisted that you want to be a freedom fighter, you first sit and weave something on the chakra for half an hour, one hour a day. Only then you have reformed yourself. Now that problem remains with India. So any number of um, foreign CEOs have told me that you have a cultural problem. People do not want to work with their hands. So I can get thousands of trained engineers when I want a job when I want to employ somebody, but I will use them for shop for supervision. They have not been trained for that, but I don't get people coming out of ITIs and polytechnics of the right quality and caliber. Now, if you want to fix this, I think a recommendation made by many expert committees, I think it's time we implemented it, which is we mainstreamed vocational education into formal school education. The Germans have the best model from the age of 14 to 18. Those who get into the vocational screen, first year, 80% time in class, 20% in a workplace. At the age of 17, last year, 80% in the workplace, 20% in the classroom. When they come out, they are globally the most efficient and productive workers in that trade. 
The German wages are far higher than that of most of their competitors, and yet these people get very high wages. And the classmate who is going in for higher education from the age of 18 to 25 lives a very austere life because he's in hostel and so on and so forth. While this worker is getting very high wage. After 25, when the classmate with higher education begins, then of course his wages go up. But Germany again is a society where the inequality levels are fairly low in the compared to other advanced countries. It's a very homogeneous society. So the day we can make vocational education part of school education, so I can come out with school leaving certificate, with my self-respect and dignity intact, with a certificate in any useful trade. I mean, it, it could be you know, even pottery or it could be fishing or it could be, you know, veterinary or any, any useful trade in the rural area or the urban areas. Then I get a qualitative transformation. Because today I have failed to do my maths or physics well. I am not good enough for higher education and therefore I must go to an ITI or a polytechnic. And that is a fundamental problem. Now, the other way I would like to describe the situation today is that large firms, and you rightly said it, have the resources to employ a young man and make him productive enough and competent enough with the rest of the world. So, so the, and this has been true of India for 200 years. I mean, the best example I would call is the British Army and the, 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 the Army. They recruited boys from the village three to six months, made them good enough to fight the Japanese, the Germans as, as, as good or as efficient soldiers. And today the larger firms do that in manufacturing. The problem is the small and medium enterprises who cannot give the resources to train these workers. And the workers do not have the time or the money to train themselves. And that is where India is paying a very heavy price in terms of lower productivity. So if I were to, you know, prioritize skill challenge, I would first train the existing workforce in medium and small and self-owned enterprises and bring their productivity levels up. Because they will be there in the workforce for the next 20, 30 years. And if they are inefficient or they use their hands in the wrong way, as they all do, then they are obviously not competitive for the global economy. So, so work with them first with state money. Then work with the youngsters who can come out and get the, the right skills. Because it is a fact that Bangladesh has done so much better than us in governments. Vietnam is doing so much better. So I think we should do honest self-introspection as to what is it that we haven't got right. And there are many things we haven't got right. So skilled workers are not the only thing or regulatory burden is not the only thing. There are many things. But unless we get all the building blocks right, we will not create more productive paying jobs. And we are right now experiencing a demographic curse, not the demographic. I mean, you see the kind of violence that is so easily provoked in large parts of India. You see agitations for reservation in non-existing government jobs becoming center stage in politics. All that is a sign of failure. Uh, Professor Unni, you want to add to that or have a comment? Um, yes, I liked uh, Adeshankarji's uh, point with regarding uh, to uh, looking at the workers who are already there in the enterprises. So this is one of my favorite, uh, you know, uh, policy recommendations that we used to have some kind of an apprentice program and all that. But the, the reality is that if you go into any of these small enterprises in, uh, say, here in Gujarat, we have Surat, which is a big hub of uh, power looms. Uh, diamond industry and so on. Now there is no training as such for a power loom. So they are uh, a power looms or hand loom or any of this textile uh, related thing. So the the young workers come and work with uh, one of the senior workers <coughs> and learn that trade. So it is a kind of day here, you know, it's basically called Ustad Chagid kind of a system. Uh, and uh, it is not recognized that uh, young fellow is paid nothing. Uh, and, uh, you know, he learns the trade and then after being uh, sort of an understudy to this person for a very long time, he might get absorbed or he moves to some other place. And he, so just recognizing that system and uh, there is a cost to that. 
because uh, like i uh, you know i'm not very happy to have too many uh, ra's uh, research assistants and uh, teaching assistants hanging around me because most of the time i have to spend my time teaching them first before they are of any assistance to me so there's a cost involved and the same cost uh, uh, is existing for these small enterprises so some kind of a system which compensate them for the fact that they are allowing these uh, young people to be on their premises uh, taking away the time uh, uh, from the you know the skilled workers there and learning uh, there so something that recognizes an already existing system and compensate them uh, in uh, financially as well would be one way in which you can build build up your uh, skill now the government recognizes that the in some sense so we have had two skill universities uh, set up right now one is in delhi which is taking all this thing together and one is in today's newspaper here in gujarat and what they are doing is all the uh, uh, itis which is the training institutes and polytechnics are affiliating to this uh, university so that what was earlier uh, sort of a diploma kind of thing that then uh, this the the existing infrastructure in all these uh, little uh, technical training institutes which is all over the state not in one place gets affiliated to this uh, university and then instead of getting a diploma they would get a uh, a degree and instead of getting a certificate they would get a diploma or you know somehow uh, trying to improve i hope they also do you know improve the infrastructure in all these itis and so on and that is happening uh, it, it, this the framework for that happening has been set up at the all india level in that skill university which is there in delhi now and they are also doing the same thing all the itis and all are, are the uh, place where the students will be working and here in gujarat it has just been announced it's been in the offing for a very long time so uh, so this whole idea of vocational education it, it is happening except that the value that i think ajay uh, shankar ji's point was that the value attributed to that vocational training is not as good as uh, it would be in germany where you know they they opt for that or they have to do that so that everybody comes out with a vocational uh, degree as well so of course then of course as academics we have this debate as to whether you know whether that's called vocationalization of education versus knowledge creation so that's a different debate which is existing when you want to make everybody just a skill worker then who's going to uh, move up in this uh, scheme of things so that is also a uh, uh, an issue but i agree that you know skill uh, training and also the fact that see when it comes to minimum wages and when it comes to um, you know how do you recognize the skill of uh, women now that you were talking about women workers uh, who are doing extremely skilled jobs but Uh, because in the hierarchy of things say in agriculture instead of doing plowing uh, they are doing uh, you know sowing or weeding or something else which is seen as a little less um, you know equally important for that production for the productivity of that crop but then they are seen as unskilled and they get uh, less wages and same goes for in the textile industry you'll see that the uh, cutting job would be done by the men and the uh, uh, you know all the finishing and all uh, all kind of other activities and similarly then the skill there is said to be less and so they get a lower minimum wage or there is no minimum wage defined at all for a lot of the uh, activities which are done by women so that whole idea of skill what is a skill who is deciding what is a skill and what is not a skill and you know how does this uh, minimum wages get fixed it's a different story that they are not paid that's different but uh, So that's all part of the issue of skill and vocationalization. Right. Thank you. Uh, we have nearly run out of time. We have five minutes, so uh, I think uh, uh, it would. If there is a extremely pressing question which someone wants to ask as a follow up question in the Q and A, uh, then we can take that. Uh, otherwise, um, I think uh, uh, I just want to make a few observations. Is that uh i we are obviously uh, these are extremely complicated and uh, tough times with the covid not helping uh, the uh, the political uh, decision making or the economic decision making is something which is uh seems to be lacking in many ways uh there is uh, the balance which is required between economic growth encouraging uh, the corporate but at the same time skilling educating your your workforce and ensuring that they have a 
you know, uh, a good life, uh, a good, uh, as uh, Mr. Shankar said, that as a family unit, uh, they are able to afford all that the family requires from education, healthcare, uh, uh, um, all uh, nutritional requirements and everything else. And, and how do we uh, bring this balance about? Uh, and the critical question is, it, is this demand for uh, democratizing the space where uh, labor is labor input is required is it going to be bottom up or is it going to be top down and uh, as as different uh, members of the society how do we think about uh, a, com a, a kind of a common action plan or or agenda which uh, various players in the society can then push as academicians or politicians or civil society organizations. So I think the discussion is long and we don't have answers. We have more questions. Uh, but if there are no more questions, then I thank all the presenters uh, uh, for their valuable inputs. And hopefully this will spark new ideas and more communication uh, between the uh, panelists and the participants. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Simona, for your technical assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Thank you.